Greetings. My name is Louis Molina, and I'm the host of the Life Pro podcast. Today, I talk to Tim Osgener, who is the founder of Osgener Family Cigars, which is a small boutique brand based out of Nashville, Tennessee, and being distributed by the Crown Heads. Tim is no stranger to the cigar industry, though. His father helped found CAO Cigars, and he worked alongside his father until they sold the company in the mid-2000s. Tim is currently on the road doing a series of cigar talks, educating new consumers to his family's cigars called the Behind the Blend. So check out some of the video and talks in this episode. If you like today's content and previous episodes, please visit us at shop.habanaport.com and check today's description for discount code. Thank you. We have it listed at six to six to oh, nine, so we're fine. Yeah, we're fine. Yeah, I'm excited about it. I think it's a yeah, it's a it, it, you know we we did something similar like with uh, Steve Sokin. I don't know who who you know in the industry, but years ago, Steve when he first launched Dunbarton, he did a tour and did oh he did yeah small events and it was awesome. I mean it was oh, one of the most great. engaging like kind of events and that's what we like. Too. Yeah, I so. like that. I like that too. I mean for me. Part of why I like want to be back in the business is engagement, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So how uh, how's it been? I guess getting back on the road since the old days. Well, I mean, the thing about being back on the road is that just you know the the part that sucks is like you know the actual travel. But mm-hmm. once you're there in the store mm-hmm. in front of people and engaging with people, it's awesome, right? Yeah. So I mean, that's that's the whole thing is everything around it has become. You know, it's just it just wears on you a bit. But once you're in front of people, I get energized by talking to other people, especially people that are passionate about the same thing that I am, which is in this case cigars and mm-hmm. and flavor, mm-hmm. and and the fact that it brings people together. Yeah, yeah, it's the logistics side of it, the unglamorous parts, right? Like yeah, the traveling, staying in the hotels, and uh, right, yeah, you know, getting tired. But once you're in the store, you, yeah, you're, yeah, you're back yeah, then you love it. I mean, yeah. it's sort of like they say, like going to if you go to the gym, like going to the gym, it's like. Oh, God, I got to go to the gym. But once you're there and you're working out, you're done. Then you're like, I'm glad I did that. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Same thing. So I don't mind being out on the road. Again, it's just sort of like the the wear and tear of the travel that that is that's the hardest part. Mm -hmm. And how long uh, how long has it been since you've been in Louisiana? Well, when was the last time you were in Louisiana? Yeah. Well, so my son has just started Tulane. Okay. So we went and we visited Tulane uh, last year. And then okay. we just moved him into Tulane about a month ago. So I feel like now that Louisiana, that's why I'm, I'm glad that I'm sitting across from you, yeah. Lewis, and I had the, the wonderful opportunity to meet, to meet your brother and your father the other day, is that like I, I'm just all into like, can I, can I get to know this culture and this state and, and not just New Orleans, but I mean like Baton Rouge, Lafayette, all these like other cities around there uh, better? Mm-hmm. Because actually I think that, I think the state and I think that like there's a really interesting history and culture that that is a part of Louisiana. And, and I think the food is world class food. So, I mean, I'm a, I'm a foodie. So I love yeah. coming down here. Look, for that I, reason too. look I'm, a, I'm a byproduct of that. Like, too much food. Yeah. So I get it. The big easy, you know. Yeah, that, 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 that could be good or bad. I mean, not good on the waistline, but like as from like a foodie standpoint or, or like oh. this high gourmet fan, like. Yeah, we got some of the best. Listen, yeah. even the uh, most casual of foods, like even like a sandwich or whatever, is yeah. like tremendous, almost like better than a regular restaurant in in your average U.S. city. I mean, for the most part, it's because they're so flavorful. I was talking to someone the other day that said, if you see, and maybe you could tell me this, if you see a um, like it might have been in a gas station that has a certain a certain food, yeah. what is it? What was the po it? boy? Usually. But yeah. You have to buy it. Yeah, yeah. Which you, you or, or you, chicken? Like, there's some great fried chicken in some of these gas stations. I mean, yeah. Like, I don't it. know about the rest of the country, but for some reason, Louisiana, yeah. don't overlook like these like you know bad looking gas station fronts. Sometimes they have the best food. Like, you never hear about that ever yeah. in any other state but Louisiana. Yeah. Like, I heard it for the first time the other day, and I was like. Holy, holy crap, yeah. really? That's the case. Yeah. I should do that. Yeah. So now I'm like kind of on the lookout for it. And I mean, mm-hmm. like, you know, Brian McGee is our regional sales manager. He's he's a big foodie. He cooks and he's like, he's looking for Cracklin. And then I hear yeah. about, crack, you know, oh, I'm man. like, what is Cracklin exactly? And then I yeah. <laughs> found out very quickly what it was. Yeah. 
So yeah. not the healthiest, but like, oh, it's just so good. And yeah, you're, yeah right? you're going to La- did you go to Laugh yet or you're going there next? Going there next. Yeah. Have you, have, you, have you been there? You, I'm assuming I've you've been, been there, there, but it's been like a long time since I've been because, you know, Rene Girard, yep, right, yep. you know, with Piper's Haven is a friend of mine for a mm-hmm. long time. I mean, you know, we used to go there all the time and do these um, events with him where he would have a crawfish boil after the event. He would have boudin, crawfish oh, yeah. boil. I mean, so and then he would have Mick. I think I think Michelob was it. What was the brown beer that Michelob did? I don't know if they do it anymore. It was like a mm. brown. I'm not sure. No, I don't I'll know. ask him about it because I'm going to see him tomorrow. But he's going. You forgot the name of that beer. Oh yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. It was, it was Michelob Brown Ale that he had on tap at the back oh, of his what? store. That's awesome. <laughs> oh yeah, dude. I mean, Renee, you, don't, yeah. you don't see this. You know, you have you have a really people are very nice over here yeah. and very hospitable. Very, yeah, very laissez faire. Like, oh, just do whatever you know. Yeah, but it's also fun. really down to earth and cool. So I like mm-hmm. I like that authenticity. Yeah, and like I was telling you earlier, uh, before we got on. I don't know about other markets in this country mm. when it comes to cigar shops and competing cigar shops. I feel like in Louisiana, like we have, I mean, I have a good rapport with a lot of the shop owners around the state. Um, you know, Renee, uh, Marjorie at Mayan, like we all have like good, just uh, Armando in the quarter. I mean, we just have good um, relations. And that, yeah. I guess that's a testament to the culture of people in Louisiana. We're just kind of like happy for the most part. I mean, everyone has their problems, but like, yeah, we don't, we, we, we what's that saying? Like, we don't work to live. Uh, yeah, 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 right, or, right, or right. You, live to work. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, we you just work to live. Work like, to we don't live, live yeah, to yeah, work. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's kind nice. of the approach. And you don't find that every. I mean, typically you don't find that everywhere. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? But you know, some place, some instances you do, particularly because of all of the uh, legislation and taxes that have been kind of targeted to the industry. It's it's mm-hmm. in a way. I mean, it's a challenge, but in a way, it's also been good because it's helped bring people together. Whether you're on like retail side or manufacturing side too, it's mm-hmm. it's forged new friendships. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that that's been helpful. You see less and less of that, or at least I see less and less of that where you have contentious relationships Mm. between people that are in similar marketplaces, because, you know, like you said, you're fighting, you're fighting just to, this is the kind of, this is the lifestyle that we want to live. And we want to have the, the opportunity and the right to, to have our lives revolve around this product. So we're all kind of like in the same boat together to try to like, Fight right. against things like legislation or other hurdles that can that can harm our business. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. So I've, no, I think that's a very valid. Those are valid points as to why I guess things are the way they are here. I mean, even with manufacturers, we did like I remember. Gosh, I mean, it was a long time ago now. It might have been close to twenty years ago where we did this when the CRA first started. Mm-hmm. You know, Cigar Rights of America. We did a tour to kind of launch the initiative, and it was a lot of different manufacturers. It was the time that, you know, my family still had CAO, and we would travel around and do all these promotions in different markets. But the amount of camaraderie that we had with one another from a manufacturing side, I mean, people still remember it to this day, and there are friendships that are still formed to this this day. Like, you know, for example, like, you know, Rocky Patel and I are like, you know, he's one of my best friends in the business. We had such great times and laughs together, and then... I got to know Lito Gomez at that time, and now when I see Lito, he's like he's always laughing because he remembers some impression that I did from 20 years ago. Yeah. It might have been him. I gotta I gotta brush up on my impression of him though. I haven't been around him as much. Now, I know you you you, you tried your stint uh, at comedy, right? At stand up comedy. Well, I kind of fell into stand up comedy because I had some friends that suggested that I do it, and then I started doing it, and then I just talked about like being born well my father has this son write it down uh, einstein wrote it down and you are no einstein so write it down immediately so i mean oh, i would imitate my dad and my mom yeah. and like being born and raised like turkish armenian in nashville tennessee and then that became like some sort of a shtick that i did that became like more of an act like you know oh, wow. how what, what would you know can you imagine what it's been like being raised by like a you know a first generation a first generation family in the u.s so that that opened the door to a lot of like impressions and comedy. So I've always been good wow. at impressions. Like how yeah. can I how can I use the impressions, you know, to make people laugh? Mm-hmm. You know, but yeah. that's part of why I like cigars, is that cigars, hopefully people are smoking it because it gives them pleasure in some way or the other. It relaxes them, it brings them to you know, it it calms them down, they can they can connect with people better, mm-hmm. but it just makes them happy, you know? And it's in that in that regard, it's very similar to like, you know, what you would do when you do stand up. In stand up, you just want to make people laugh. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not you're not doing it. I mean, that's what I would do. It I would do it because I really enjoy. Um, I enjoy it when people are in a good mood and in an elevated yeah. mood. So yeah. in that in that regard, it's it's similar to cigars for me. Yeah, at least. I think that mindset is is definitely um, 
ubiquitous in, in this industry, right? With with cigars, it's it's we're in the business. I don't view it as just selling cigars. We're in the business of making people happy. Totally, right? 100%. So whether it be laughing, you know, you go to the, yeah. that cigar lounge that they have their pranksters and jokes and all, and people laughing while they're smoking. It's yeah. just, it all it's all related, right? And that's one thing that's underrated and not talked about is that you just hit on it. It's almost like um, the cigar stores have become almost like the cheers of like yeah. of society. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like if you think about it, I mean, you're getting together to smoke a cigar. You're not getting together to to over, I mean, okay, yeah, you want to have like maybe a beverage or two, maybe, but you don't have to to have a good time. Mm-hmm. But you're, you're, you, this product and the stores are areas where people can get together and like enjoy one another's company. Yeah, you know, in a safe environment, really. Yeah, yeah. So I view it like is that cigar stores are are actually doing our cities and societies a favor by existing because you're offering a place where That's people right. can go and smoke in the in the comfort of a space in an environment. So I feel that people need to go and support these stores that create this environment that that you can come and like connect with one another over a cigar. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's definitely true. And I think the people who've been in this business forever kind of maybe they've never really vocalized that, but they intrinsically know that mm-hmm. and know those dynamics. Um, that's why I've always had a conspiracy theory. Like maybe that's why they hate cigar shops, because they know there's like the last bastion of like free thinking and people getting together and ideas forming and, you know, like, they don't want that, you know. But I, I don't know that's true. I right. don't know. I think it's because, like, they don't – I mean, the people that are maybe want to legislate um, mm. cigars uh, don't uh, – aren't knowledgeed up enough to understand the differences between, like, say, a cigarette and a cigar. Now, our industry's oh, yeah. gotten better about doing that and educating them, and I think we've been very effective and done a great job. Mm-hmm. But I think it never hurts to always repeat it over and over and over. Like, you know, what's there is a difference between, like, you know, with cigarettes, it's all about nicotine delivery and you want to inhale it with cigars. It's not about that at all. It's about the nuance of flavor and pulling it into the back of your palate and how does it taste. And, you yeah, know, like, all like that, a wine, right? Like, yeah, a, like ex- a fine wine. Exactly. And yeah. I mean, you know, the event that we're going to be doing, like, here is all about, it's very similar to wine. You know, it has to do with, like, the soil and the microclimate in which the tobacco is grown in and then, like, those nutrients going into the, into the stock and into the, you know, with the wine, it's through the vine and into the grapes, and here it's through the stalk and into the leaves. And, like, you know, how does that taste on its own independently? And and once you get a feeling of that, then it's almost like spices in your spice cabinet. This is what cumin tastes like, cinnamon, nutmeg. And then, you know, what happens if you combine them? Then you're taking one organism that is a pure organism of, you know, to use an example, let's say black pepper. But then when you combine the black, black pepper with, like, cinnamon, and then you slow cook it with a specific meat... Then it becomes like a new organism, a new kind of flavor. Mm. It's very similar with cigars, similar in that regard to wine too. Yeah. But I mean, I feel like in wine, they've done a really good job of like um, educating people to that. And so really what, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to kind of, you know, bring that to the cigar business. Mm-hmm. And, and I like doing it. I like communi- I like trying to communicate that with people and I like it to be more of a conversation and listen, I'm, I don't claim to be an expert in anything. I mean, I, I know what I know, and I try to con- convey that. And if I don't know something, then I'm going to say, I'm going to, I will write it down <laughs> because I am no Einstein. And then I'll get back to him. <laughs> is that an impression of your dad? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah totally. Yeah. And for people who don't know, because uh, this is something we've talked about before getting on, mm-hmm. um, you know, you have been out, I guess, of the, the industry mm-hmm. zeitgeist for, for a minute. Some of these new smokers, maybe in the last year or five years, they might not know your family history, but can you go? You do mind going into a little oh, yeah, bit of yeah, that? No, of course. Before you do, I'm gonna light up too. Uh, yeah, sure. You need a lighter. Is there, yeah. Um, what are you smoking, by the way? I'm smoking. Is that the Aramis? So this is our our new one. This is the like Oz Family Cigar uh, Fursat blend. Okay, so the Fursat. Fursat, okay. Fursat means opportunity, and we wanted to use Liberty Opportunity. It's inspired by the Statue of Liberty because the brand is a story kind of about, you know, my mom and dad and how they kind of started a life in the u.s you know uh on one side of it is shows armenia because my dad's armenian the other side shows turkey because my dad uh was you know armenian born and raised in istanbul he met my mom my mom's from turkey they met in new york city they eloped to tennessee so all of those elements are in the vista yeah. and in the band of the cigar so you know that's why i wanted to kind of name it or be you know usually at cao in the past um, we did things in threes, trilogies. So we're kind of doing the same thing here. We want to have a brand identity around, like, you know, sort of in a trilogy 
and then kind of start a whole other identity for a brand. So, for example, at CAO, we had Brasilia, Italia, America, mm -hmm. and then we had uh, MX2, CX2, LX2. So yeah. we like to kind of, that format worked for us, so I like kind of compartmentalizing mm -hmm. sort of like what's the identity of, of a certain kind of uh, uh, theme of around a around an initiative around that. Okay. So, but to answer your question from before, I mean, uh, yeah, CAO started in 1968 um, from the basement of our home with Meerschaum pipes. My dad was an engineer. He was working at DuPont, mechanical engineer. He didn't like the engineering of, he liked Meerschaum pipes, which were made in Turkey, you know, a, you know, which is a That's white right. mineral. But he didn't like the way that the stem connected to the pipe because typically the stems, you would shove them in and pull them out which was fine for a briar pipe, but for a Meerschaum pipe, my dad was like, well, this is going to create a stress fracture, you know, terrible. You know, so he made a, he made a threading because he was working on microfibers, like for polyester and stuff like this, that you could twist in and twist out the stem. He went to some tobacconists, like such as yourselves, of influence, and they were like, oh, I like the quality of this uh, stem. Uh, who did that? My dad's like, well, I made it. And the, and the retailer was like, well, can I order some? My dad's like, son, listen, when you are Armenian, when someone gives you an order, the answer is always yes. He was like, how many <laughs> yes. you want? I give you 12 plus one yeah. and a free hubcap. Okay. So, like, so, so, yes, so then people that. started like ordering the pipes from our home. They would call and say, I want these pipes. And uh, oh, yeah, uh, put your initials on the pipe. So we know it's the same thing as what we heard about. And his initials were... You know, first name Jano, spelled C-A-N-O, middle name Aret, last name Osgener, so C-A-O. He would he bought a drill from a hardware store, and he would drill his name into the shank of the pipe. So that's And then he eventually he replaced that with some sort of, like, you know, sticker medallion that went into the stem. So that's how he got the name C-A-O. Started with pipes in 68. He started it part-time, and then he went full-time into that into, like, 77. Whoa. And then we got into humidors in the early 90s. That was when cigars started to take off, you know, due to like, you know, the popular, you know, cigar aficionado came out and celebrities started smoking. It became more like fashionable. And so we had humidors that were made out of solid wood in Nashville. And I mean, all through this time, my sister and I were working with my dad in order to earn allowance or off and on for summer jobs, that kind of thing. And then, and then when we got into um, cigars, that was like in 94. Um, you know, I was, I was, I went to college out in, uh, in California at, uh, I graduated, you know, from Southern Cal. And then when I graduated there in 93, then, you know, I was, you know, and I went out there because I was interested in being an actor. So my dad's like, how can you make money doing that crap? And I'm like, <laughs> if I get into a really good school, will you support my decision? He's like, well, then I guess, okay, you must have an iota of talent if that is the case. So I got an SC school for like acting. And, um, and then when I graduated, I was, like, doing acting stuff, like, you know, during the day. And, I mean, during the night. And then during the day, I was visiting smoke shops. And at the time, our cigars, this is, like, when the boom hit. So product mm -hmm. was totally inconsistent. So we'd have one box of cigars that would be, you know, brown, the color we wanted. Another box would be green. Exact same label. So can you imagine you're opening cigars to have on your shelf? And you'd be like, dude, these are, like, so inconsistent. How can I sell this product? That's what we went through. Yeah. So I went around and, like, I just would buy cigars from different retailers and say, you know, Lewis, what would it take for me to be successful in your store? And you would say, Tim, look, you're a nice guy. I like your, I know you, I know your dad, I know your sister, these cigars sell for these reasons. So I'd buy them and then smoke them. And then I established like a um, palette for what, what it was that people were looking for. And then I tried to, you know, deliver that with what we created at CAO. And then, and then finally we hit a nerve in like 1998 and things started working with that. Like we did a, we did a box press Maduro that was had a red label. It was called our uh, Lanniversaire Maduro. Oh yeah. yeah, and then that was that really hit a nerve with people. And then we kind of we kept kind of doing something every year mm -hmm. that was you know, and you know, this is this business is like it's a fun business, it's a social business like we talked about earlier, but it's also not an easy business. I mean, it's right. not something that I would necessarily like recommend for somebody to get into like cold because i mean well you know i mean you see people every day mm -hmm. it's a very nuanced and difficult business i yeah. mean you know it's it's complex it's complex so you know but then we kept you know and some so my point to saying that is that some stuff worked better than others at cao but the stuff that worked then you just kind of you know you you go with the flow you've got to you've got to ride that ride what's strong and 
and we kept building the brand and then we weren't looking at selling the brand but it was um it was at a time at the end of 07 when you had like you know economic struggles of like the housing bubble bursting and then yeah. you had s chip that came in to increase excise taxes and more threats of legislation and and um and at that time we were like okay well maybe it's the right time to kind of not have all of our families uh you know value equity in 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 tobacco which could be legislated out of existence yeah um right. but i was loving right. it I, I wasn't you know i i i you know i think about all the time like okay well what if we'd still had cao under our kind of um under just family ownership but you know it is what it is i mean you know it's there's reasons why sometimes things happen in life mm -hmm. and 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 you know what you're always going to have adversity so you just got to you just have to you know, go with the flow, you know? But I wouldn't, I mean, I'm sure you think about that and, I, and I'm and i not prying into like who came to that decision ultimately looking back on it, like just extra viewer outside. I wouldn't fault that decision because at the time, right, it, there was a lot of uncertainty mm -hmm. given the financial conditions of the time. And look, I mean, there've been plenty of people in the industry, you know, who have sold their interests and maybe waited out and then get back in it. Like EP Creo, Right, um, right. Uh, Christian, said, right. Um, right. Yeah, and like I don't know if it was STG at the time who bought you guys, or it was, it was Sweetest yeah, Match. It was it was STG. Yeah. It was STG at the yeah, time. It yeah. wasn't Sweetest Match. No, no, it was before. It was like STG had no presence at all. Nobody knew who mm. they were, in, um, and they wanted to get into the premium mm. end of it. So, but then after they that, they started buying every like so many they did brands. That, yeah, they did that first, and then they had an agreement with Swedish Match, and then Swedish Match had. Um, their offices were located in Richmond, Virginia. And so because after they acquired us and they wanted to leave everything as is, so they, you know, at the time I was like, you know, I was the president. So they, they left me there and then they brought in a chairman who I know and li liked very much to come in and work with us, which that worked fine. And then when they merged with Swedish Match, then then they moved distribution to Richmond, Virginia. And then at that mm. point, like everybody that was with CAO originally, you know, didn't didn't want to move to Richmond, Virginia, you know, so... Oh, okay. That's kind of what what led to that, you know, that kind of merger being complete was around 2010. Yeah. So people forget, and, and I I remember reading the stories that CAO, your father started off as, yeah, a pipe. He was in the pipe mm -hmm. sector first, mm -hmm. and then in the, the accessories. But when the boom happened, I guess he saw the the opportunity, like, oh, let me offer cigars, because I mean, I remember some of the brands back then that were popular that no longer around, really. Right. Um, but they were, you know, people were just just making money left and right. It seemed. Um, I I start I first started smoking cigars in '96, and I even remember some of those like really green tasting, inconsistent. Oh, listen, cigars. I mean, I I found one the other day. Like I'm doing these uh um these like Instagram kind of episodes from like my father's humidor because I love I love those. Humidor. Yeah, those are awesome. By the well, way, well, I have one that I shot the other day. I haven't put it up yet. That has that. Like mm -hmm. literally, I'm opening up a. It might be a four pack of cigars from 1994, and the cigars green. Oh my gosh! Yeah, oh yeah, and the cigars. And they were, it wasn't on purpose to be a candela. It was just rushed. Right. Yeah. And I mean, when I opened it, honestly, I did not expect to see that because you know time has passed so much that you're like, it couldn't have been that green. Come on. But then I opened it. I was like, yeah, it was. Because yeah. you know, cigars it's supposed to be like this color, like more of a tan color. Yeah. And you open it and you're like, no, it's it's green. Yeah. And it's almost like nowadays, like unfathomable that you would do that, right? right. Because I think that the quality now of the cigars is like mm -hmm. so good, you know, which is it's a great time to be a cigar consumer because the quality That's is right. so good and consistent across the board. But I mean, there's such nuance to it now that it's it's a bit fascinating, you know? Mm -hmm. But the supply and demand back then was different, right? Like the demand was just that much higher. And then supplies. So you had a lot yeah. of fly by night companies. Yeah, I'm even. I even remember buying a, or my brother bought a humidor lined with pine, and I told him, "Oh my gosh, you shouldn't have done that. Like that's you don't do that. I mean, because as you know, it's just that's just yeah. too strong aromatic. All your yeah, cigars yeah, yeah. gonna taste like pine. So oh my God. you literally had like fly by night companies that yeah. either didn't know what they were doing or they were just fraudulent just to get something out and mm -hmm. just make that money. Um, but that, well, that popped. was that was dangerous too because I mean, like you know, for us. You know, again, the first few brands that we did were like, uh, they say you learn you learn by by failing, and you just don't want to make your failures too big. But I mean, our first few brands like didn't hit, mm -hmm. just because of the reason that you're talking about right yeah. now. I mean, you can't, and you, you know, didn't have control of the the manufacturing, right? Like you had, 
I mean, yeah, no, we, we, listen, we had good manufacturing relationships, but it's just, you know, I would go down to these factories mm. and it was like, um, it was chaos. You know, I mean, like it was, it was people running around all over the place. Um, I remember going down to specifically Honduras and it was raining and, and people were all over and they're trying to get these cigars out. And it was, it was like nothing you've ever seen. It was like chaos. Wow. So, I mean, I, and that was my first visit, right? So my first visit was like, first oh, impression. my God, it's just like nuts. I mean, how do you get anything done? I mean, you know, it's so, but then things kind of like as, as you know, things kind of calm down. And then after they mm -hmm. calmed down, that was, yep. that was better for the quality of the cigars, for sure. That's right. But yeah. that was, that was a, that was a crazy period. I don't know if we'll have something like that, but yeah, you're right. That yeah. was. You know, Today, the, though, the supply and demand are pretty equal. So I think yeah. that's why you have this, this renaissance of like really high quality like the game is, is it's very competitive so yeah. everyone has to like offer the best quality right now yeah and the interesting thing was that also um and you know ernesto perez carrillo and i have been friends for a long time so we had this dialogue where there was a um uh it might have been before our trade show where we had like um i mean i think david savona from cigar aficionado asked us like you know can you talk about like the two like cigar booms that we've experienced and like how they were different and I mean, you know, Ernesto said it very well that it was like, you know, at, at the second boom was kind of predicated by the pandemic. You know, you had the pandemic, you had all of a sudden people having to like, you know, be at home all the time, work from home. And so what happened with consumption of, let's say, um, uh, you know, alcohol and liquor and cigars is that it increased, you know, because people could, you know, they, they don't have to worry about like, okay, can I go into this establishment and smoke a cigar? It's their own home. They can do whatever they want to do, you know. So, so then, then like you know, you had this boom that increased because of like the pandemic. But that, you know, at that time, to your point, is that the tobacco that they had available was still very, you know, high quality tobacco. But then, the, then the amount of consumption increased as far as number of sticks in the U.S. But now you could say now things that as they have normalized, has that level of increase has it maintained to that number of level? I mean, like for example. Typically, it was around 300 million premium cigars that were being uh, mm -hmm. um, imported into the U.S., and that number was going up to around the $500 million mark during the pandemic, and now where are they? Oh, oh the unit. Yeah, 500 I mean? million they, units. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. 500 million units. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know. Now you're entering a period where, you know, you've had... Um, you've had the inflation that has that has that has risen, you know, also mm -hmm. due to like COVID and the after effects of COVID, and then, and then now you are, you're entering an election year, which typically you know there's some uncertainty around that. So it's it's sort of been a uh, um, it's been a it's been a period now this year where there's that kind of a bit of a trepidation period. So it'll be interesting to see what happens next year as things kind of hopefully you know. Hopefully things kind of like normalize and there there's more of a, a feeling of, okay, we know we know what the next, you know, four years are going to kind of, you know, you know, not kind of be. But you know, after you get through the election cycle, what what happens? And also like potential interest rates dropping, you know, mm -hmm. what what does that mean? Mm-hmm. What or does the where does the economy kind of settle at? Yeah, it's interesting you Bring that up. I was just on the phone with uh, another company owner earlier today uh, out of Honduras, is all I'll say, because, you know, we've been starting off our own brands, right? Mm -hmm. And my father was telling me he had some good conversation with you yesterday about yeah, that. Yeah, your father's great. Um, yeah. And today, it seems, and maybe you can, and you verified it, the, the pinch point isn't the tobacco, it's it's the the paper goods, right? Yeah. The, the, the bands or the labels, right. the right. vistas. Yeah. That's been like the choke point. And when you told them the, yeah. the, the, the delay in weeks, we, we we can yeah. verify that that's about it's about 16 weeks if if not longer yeah you know? yeah yeah that's become that's become really, very difficult you know mm -hmm. um because so the scars are other... the problem you can get those made or, yeah or, relative right um but it's the paper goods that that are the problem yeah it's not just that but a lot of times it can be the boxes the boxes too. yeah mm -hmm. you know i mean it's just the amount of lead time that it takes for them to do that i mean it's longer than you think so that that has become a bit of a challenge and also you have this dynamic of you know, there have been a, a number of stores that I've that I've visited even on this trip that say like, you know, people come in and they want to know they want what's new. They're asking what's new. Hmm. And so if you always are looking for something that's new, yeah. then then how long um, how long of a uh, shelf life does something like that have? Mm -hmm. And I mean, 
you know, probably comparative to like, you know, 20 years ago, if people are wanting new all the time, well, then that yeah. means that you always have to have new bands, new boxes, yeah. Yeah. new blends. I mean, or the blends could be like a slight variant of a blend that you already have that might taste, you, ch you change one leaf and it could taste dramatically different. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So the blends may not necessarily have to vary all that much, hypothetically, for it to taste a lot different. Mm -hmm. But how you identify it and, and what you come up with and if there is a big le a big lag on that, you know, it becomes very difficult. Very very difficult. I yeah. mean, how do you kind of forecast what it is that like, you know, people are looking for, and then then you might have like price. And if people are looking for price to come up with a good, you know, value cigar for what they're looking at, I mean, and you know, what I mean, it's and then mm -hmm. you have all of these different taxes that we talked about earlier. Yep. I mean, it's that's why I say it's like a complicated business. It's a complex business. You I mean you know that better than anyone. Yeah. No, I mean we both do. Uh, but he, that that man, same manufacturer was telling me that what he's doing is just making as many cigars right now as he can and just warehouse them because he anticipates more inflationary pressures next year. Things are going to get more expensive, so it's better just to like get them made now at the lower price point, and so you can make better margin when when those increases do come next year. Um, and he said some of the big some of the big retailers in this country are starting to do that too. They're starting mm -hmm. to just kind of warehouse and buy, you know, and convert their cash into like inventory. That way, when the price increases do come, you know, that that's, you know, I've always told people holding assets because I come from a financial background, holding assets in the long term with inflation, you're, you'll always win. Right. I mean, it's not as good to carry or, or hold on to cash unless you can get a good interest rate on it um, because you can just get more of a return holding on to like long term assets, whether it be land or you know, cigars, inventory, mm -hmm. uh, notwithstanding the, the taxes you might have to pay every year. But, like, if the price increases out, outdo, out, outdo that, then then you're winning, you know? Well, certainly if you have, like, for example, if you have, um, you know, like when we had CAO, I'll use that as an example. If mm -hmm. we had our staple brands were, like, CAO Gold and CAO Brasilia, as an example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if CAO Brasilia were using Brazilian Arapiraca wrapper, which we were, then we always believed that if there was a good um, – opportunity to to have to your point uh, more inventory of that tobacco at a certain price then then one should should do that you know what i mean that's what we mm -hmm. would communicate with you know our manufacturing partner and on off and sometimes towards the end there if they said um you know after we had a mature brand and we had it so that 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 people we had we had regular customers that liked that blend or liked cao then we would tell the manufacturer, look, if you need if you need our help with procuring this tobacco, that we would help them do it. You know, for the same reason that that you're talking about is that that's a that's an asset tobacco that is a mm -hmm. you know what I mean. You find the right tobacco that people like, and that's and it's a more valuable asset. Yeah, was that a, a challenge to work or source that Brazilian arapiraca for you or, or the manufacturer that was? You know, at the t at the time, so we were working with there was a. Um, that was a factory. His name was uh, uh, the gentleman's name was Fidel Olivas, and we worked also with the Taranos. Mm -hmm. So, like you know, it was kind of like a partnership between the Taranos and and uh, the Olivas family. Um, not Oliva, but Olivas in in uh, in Nicaragua. So that was that was pretty easy to work with. And at the time, Arapidaca wasn't problematic, you know. And then up to and then them obtaining it. Okay. Um, it may have even honestly been some other filler tobaccos, like for example, like Esteli filler tobaccos are you know very very good. And you know, there's always a desire to have that and you always tend to use that or jalapa and a lot of different blends. So, so to be able to go in and if there was a good opportunity to, to invest in that, then, then you could do that and help, help the factory in that way. So, so when we had the opportunity to do it again, again, this was toward like when CAO was a very, very mature brand, you know, okay. we would do that. We probably wouldn't yeah. have done that like at the very beginning, just because, you know, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't have, um, we didn't have like an established kind of brand that we knew that that people really liked this blend, and we wanted to, you know what I mean? There was a there was a track record for it, and and there was a following for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I kind of like I understand what you're talking about when you're saying you know investing in some assets. The only thing I would say right is now, that, you know, now yeah. if if you anticipate the prices to increase next year or the cost of goods to go up, right, know? right. Yeah, the only thing I would say is that, like, you know, if if he's making a cigars and and sitting on the cigars, I just, you know, hopefully it's the blend that he knows is like this is a this is a blend that I know that people like. This is a blend mm -hmm. that I know right. that that will improve mm -hmm. um, with age. Mm -hmm. You know, because typically, 
if the cigar is like got darker tobaccos in it, fuller bodied cigars, then then you know you make them and then they they age and they rest. They tend to like in in my view mm-hmm. they improve. You know, because yeah. they become a little bit more... Well, they're different, um, right? They're different yeah. younger versus older. Yeah, for sure. They're well, smoothed but, out, right? But if, it was like, but if it was like a milder blend, for example, versus a fuller-bodied blend, I think the fuller-bodied blend, you know, ages... Oh, ages up. Yeah, well, yeah, ages better, mm-hmm. you know what mm-hmm. I mean, over time. Not, not it's better, like a cab, right? With like that's deep right. tannins. That's right. Those can age long better than like a, a young... 100%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you hit so the nail same, on the same, 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 with same, same, same principle. Mm-hmm. With yeah, that. I didn't think about that. He didn't tell me about that. I'm, I'm, I'll am i try to ask him which cigars if he... Because, yeah, that, that's the other function, right? If time, like that could change the blend. So is that good or bad? Uh, mm. and well, the, again, it, the, again, it depends on like what the blend is. You know, like yeah. like for example, we had a Maduro that we came up with a Mexican San Andreas wrapper that had like, you know, uh, you know, had uh, I think Jalapa Viso and like some Lajero in there and like okay. darker tobaccos in there. So for that, when it sits and it ages, then I mean, I think that it it only we found that it improved it. You know. But mm. but one that might be like have milder tobaccos in them, like you know more, you know Seiko's Visos from the lower positioning on the plant, um, or maybe like a blonder wrapper on it, like you know Connecticut Ecuador, then, you know maybe not so much. So it kind of depends on like what what type of blend, is you know in this case like whoever wants to sit on, you yeah. know, yeah. Hmm. And is it a blend that like you know that that people are liking right now that he feels comfortable with making and sitting on you know because yeah. if it's a blend that like maybe people don't like as much then then you're in the, have the pressure of like okay I've got to like free up my space or I've got to you know I've got to sell these so that I can have cash flow so that I can invest in in other tobaccos or you know what I mean like yeah. Yeah. to make to make new blends yeah and then there's the risk hopefully our I don't know about you guys but like our cigars down there able. To- to get insurance, are you able to get insurance on that? Because I'm thinking about the fire that was yeah. just announced at Agonorsa, and that's something that's a risk that I don't think enough end consumers really understand is the, the fire risk that can happen, like in the pre-industry stage and in the in the, the pilones, the fermenting warehouses, or just the bale houses. Well, I mean, I, I can't speak to that 100 percent because yeah. I, that that's not I don't I don't own one of those, but I mean I would imagine 100 mm-hmm. percent that they have them insured. I would yeah. think. Yeah, because I thought I heard that maybe some of those. Kind of operations, especially like I'm thinking about the pilones, right? The the, the stage for people who don't know. What we're talking about where they put the tobacco in piles and yep. let it ferment. At least they they don't really have like extinguishers or or some fire uh, anti fire measures because if water gets on it, it's ruined anyway. So like why why worry about you know if, if it catches on fire? I don't know. Maybe I don't know if you've ever heard of that or I think I just remember one of these factory visits years ago that it just kind of stuck with me. Um, at yeah, least with the I'm, fire measure, uh, but I don't know about insurance. Maybe, I don't know. I'm sure, hopefully, that your the company is able to to get insurance on. I it. mean, I can I can speak from like my visits to like Casa Carrillo where where Ernie makes his cigars, and I mean, and I'm trying to think if I remember seeing like kind of sprinkler systems that he has over there in the event of a fire. And mm-hmm. I mean, I believe I can't. I don't. I don't want to overspeak, but I think that he does have them. Okay. But I think that like you know. I mean, where they are doing the pilons and where the temperature might be, mm-hmm. where they're where they're up. purposefully needing the temperature to be at a higher degree, mm-hmm. then they're kind of sensitive to like that element being turned off in that room. Okay. At that, you know, just for that specific reason or that specific part of like you know the process of getting the tobacco ready or getting the you know the cigars ready. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because where they where they box press, you know, for example, like Ernesto has a different methodology of how they box press the cigars start round. They go into a room that's like a relatively small room with like racks on them. And then it's like 100 percent humidity that's sprayed into the environment. And then the cigar becomes like sopping wet. They take it out. They put it on the you know, they put it on the planks and they they press it with a vice. Then it goes out and it goes into a room that's almost like a steam room where it's very dry, but high heat. And so then then that extrudes the moisture from the cigar. And then, you know, that's kind of locks in that that shape. Yeah, and that's how, that? that's how they box press, which is like oh. inc- incredibly labor intensive. I mean, I've I've never seen anybody box press it like that, so I thought that mm. was pretty extraordinary. But I mean, you know, and so we were talking about in rooms like that. These are smaller rooms, so they're probably you know, you know, they're not having sprinklers in that room. Yeah. You know, I didn't I didn't look, so I can't. Yeah. But I would imagine that yeah. that you know they're. I mean, that's that's a that's a variant. So I would imagine in that room that they that they don't. Mm-hmm. But in other rooms where they might be having tobacco storage, then you know, they probably do. Mm-hmm. But again, it's a, it's a good point that you bring up. I mean, I'm I'm going to look mean, at the fire it next risk time. is one of the most I guess totally 
at least from the manufacturing side, right? Like one of the most, I guess, uh, risky concerns. Sure. I mean, even Fuente went through that yeah, too. Famously, Fuente, you know, Willie Ventura. I think last year, two years ago, like it just seems like in the last twenty years, I'm seeing or reading. Maybe I'm just paying more attention to that topic when the fire breaks out. You know, at a cigar warehouse or factory. You know. Um, and I didn't follow that. I saw what you were talking about with that that happening at Agronorsa, and I don't know what what caused that. Yeah, Do you know what caused no, it? no, I didn't read the details. I just saw the headlines and they saw the YouTube video Half Wheel put out. Um, it was like some local uh, Nicaraguan media outlet that had some video of some of the fire they were trying to put out. So I just hope that it wasn't something that someone did on purpose. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because that would be terrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, mm -hmm. why why do that to anyone? You know? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For yeah. That I mean that'd be terrible for sure um so i mean they have these investigations but i, I i'm sure i've heard of certain or, or there are instances where maybe a pilon gets too hot right because as you know that process it, it generates a lot of heat typically, and, and, and aren't there that cases where like a, a pile can like self-combust if, if, if not i mean it could, managed? it could but typically they're so well managed mm -hmm. but in my experience mm -hmm. when i've seen them i mean that is like i mean there are people monitoring that like you know what i mean mm -hmm. because like we said before i mean that's a valuable asset what they're looking over you know what i mean so typically when i have seen it i mean that is a that is carefully monitored and people are over there all the time so that that yeah. doesn't happen mm -hmm. so uh you know but then there's lightning strikes or some faulty electrical um yeah who i'm sure in the cigar industry's history of 500 years i'm sure there have been cases of like fraud or or like uh, corporate uh, uh, espionage or things like that, but um, well, typically, yeah, the I fire, mean, I, the fire case is just yeah, always always concerning for for the. Industry. I mean, typically, if it's like a more sophisticated manufacturer, whether it's like tobacco or you know, like you know, Agrinors is pretty sophisticated. So I mean, like I, that's why I was like, you know, I don't I don't know what what the circumstances were that that happened there, but that's mm -hmm. you know really unfortunate to hear. And I I heard that was it a firefighter may have lost his life, which is like oh wow. I, I, yeah, I didn't hear. I, I didn't don't know. I mean, or or got seriously injured from it. I mean, like you know, you, that, that's that's terrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, tragic. You don't want to you don't want to hear something like that ever. Mm -hmm. uh, so change topics during the CAO days. Who was responsible for like the brand development? Was it your father primarily? Did was it you and your father and the family? Uh, did you have a, a, an art director or how, how did that come about? Because um, the reason I'm asking is I felt back then. Uh, CEO to me was like the company that really changed like the marketing game, right? They were so innovative um, with like the merch that you, I guess you didn't really see before that. Um, I'm thinking of like the licensing partnerships, the, the ventures that I'm sure you probably have the older clients still asking and lamenting for some of those those brands back then. You probably know what I'm, I'm alluding to. Yeah. Um, it, it just seemed that your, your, your family and the company was so innovative when it came to that approach. Yeah. Uh, who was responsible for like some of these idea generate uh, that, that were generated? I mean, I think it was like a team effort. We had a really good team at CAO, so I wouldn't say that it was any any one person. I mean, okay. I think that we we were fortunate that like we found a good team that, you know, I mean, my father, my father was always more of like kind of a uh, he was an engineer. Right. So mm -hmm. he always had this kind of engineering approach and he was very mathematical so he always liked to kind of you know he was the kind of guy that would have a left brain huh? he would yeah. have a mechanical pencil and you'd, you'd look at like you know the he would look at the balance sheet or the PL and he would underline like you know with his mechanical pencil and the mechanical ruler like why are we spending so much on the toilet paper you know like some yeah, stuff yeah. like this to make sure yeah. that people were on their toes mm -hmm. i came from a more creative background so I like to kind of i like to visit stores i like to listen to people I like to see what the trends are what's going on and then try to throw out a crazy idea and then let the let the um let our team kind of like say you're crazy or there's something to it so that was more like my kind of style and approach and then you know john huber had been with us for a long time mm -hmm. you know and and john always has a good eye for like that as well mm -hmm. you know creativity and like you know all of the swag and stuff like that i mean that was he was leading that and you know he and you know a lot of our marketing initiatives and stuff like every, you know he had a hand in that too and we would but we would all talk about it and we had okay. really good we had a really good sales team you know we had um a gentleman named Adam Shepard had been with us for a long time who was also like looking over like operations and finance and another gentleman named Mike Condor who we still work with yep. at Crown Heads and yeah. he also had a very kind of um analytical and strategic approach to things mm -hmm. And then we had a really good um, regional sales manager like Brian McGee, who's here, had been with us for a long time. And so there were a lot of different people that you could bounce stuff. And even 
before that, we had brokers who were very helpful. You know, we would bounce stuff off them and they would give really good feedback. So mm-hmm. I would say it was just for whatever reason, we um, I think we like to have a, a open ended culture where we could ask people, what what do you think about this? And we would even like and that would even extend into like friends of ours that were like retailers, tobacconists. We'd ask them, what do you think about this? And then they would say, well, you know, we like this. We don't like that. Or you think, you know, this size would do, you know. Mm-hmm. So we kind of adopted this approach of being very um, being very open-minded and asking a lot of questions. So, you know, because we did that, that kind of, I think that kind of assisted us. So I, I wouldn't say at the end of the day that it was, it was one person. It was just that we happened to have like a pretty good team that got along together. And when I was away from it for a while, I could look back on it and recognize that, you know, because after um, after we had sold CAO, we converted our warehouse into a uh, nonprofit contemporary art center, mainly showing like, you know, more kind of like cutting edge, innovative, like contemporary performing arts. And then we'd bring that to schools that didn't have art programs because my mom was an educator and she always was a big believer in kids having creativity in their lives was really important because that helped them, whether they become accountants or they go in the cigar business or they become artists, that helped them with complex problem solving. Yeah. Yeah. So so we like to do that. And I know that when we started that venture, you know, it, it took a long time to get the right people on your team. And now we have like good people on our team for our art center. And it's, you know, now it's doing very well, like where I don't have to stress out over, you know, looking after that. Because at first I was like, helping build that up. Um, so I think that in the long answer to your question is that like we had, you know, we had a really good kind of, you know, almost like a symphony. We had a really good kind of mm. players together that like worked well and, and that helped us on the line, you know? Um, but yeah, it was an, it was an interesting process and listen in this business, not everything, not everything works, uh, like you, like you think it's going to work. You always have to like put things out and then if it does work great if it doesn't work you know you got to like they adjust to you got to yeah. that's right yeah. that's that's kind of the name of the game yeah yeah so i mean for example i've been fascinating fascinated and, and maybe you have an answer to this is that like now i notice like you know uh, you know <clears throat> and i was away from the business for about a decade right and uh 60 ring gauge was like the biggest ring gauge typically yep. you'd have well now you see ring gauges that are like 70 ring gauges 80 ring gauges a hundred ring gauge. Yeah. And I'm just surprised, especially in Louisiana, that, you know, people are buying these big ring gauges. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, what, what's, why is that happening? Can you have an explanation oh, I mean, for that? It's just cultural shift. I mean, yeah, I remember like when I first started smoking cigars in the late nineties and then getting in the business 2003, like, yeah, 60 ring gauge was like abhorrent. Right. Remember the immensos from Nick? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from Perdomo, like, Back then, that was like huge and just insane, and he he was just a little too early. Uh, he retired that, but then like I guess in late two thousands, maybe twenty twelve, twenty fifteen, that's when you started seeing like the extreme ring gauges, right? Going to like seventy. Um, I think JFR really kind of helped start that, like Agnorsa, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, is and, that- then, and then they just kept pushing the envelope, and then it was also a good price point, right? So that was the other thing, like. I don't think the 70 or 80 ring gauges would work if the prices were like really high. I mean, yeah, they, is that more of a value for money I think it, type I think cigar? It is. I think there's this perception from that client who, number one, it could be be a status thing, uh, but it's also like they're getting more cigar for like less, right? So they're getting value. Um, and I actually, we have the capacity like with our system, I'm going to generate that report. Uh, if not today, I'll, I'll, I'll do it over the next few days and I'll text you or email you. Um, we have tags that we can generate report to see like, what are the best selling ring gauges? Um, Interesting. now I'm kind of curious now. I don't, I don't think it's a, a lot, but like it's enough to, for a manufacturer to offer that SKU, you know, in their portfolio, but it's, it's certainly not like the bread and butter. If, if they disappeared, we'd be fine without it, but like, it's still enough to where, you know, based on the price point, if it's if it's attractive, we'll we'll give it a shot and bring it in, and our clients will will buy it. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, you're right. I didn't even think about like from the time of when you guys started, um, the seventy ring gauge was just like that would be unfathomable. And yeah, there's some companies offering the hundred plus. Again, that's not that's we rarely sell those, but like we have sold them, we we stock them. 
But the interesting thing about what you said is that like it's not enough that you come up with like a big ring gauge cigar. It's also like a price thing too. Mm-hmm. It's a, it has it to be depend- a price. It has yeah. to be a specific price yeah. for it as well. Yeah, if that so, seventy ring gauge is like twenty bucks or above, like they're not gonna. It's not gonna sell. But like a right. lot of these, and I think I would attribute Agonorsa to really like successfully making like you know, figure out that equation. That. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it, maybe it makes sense for them because I mean they're also like. I mean, if they're growing tobacco yeah, and they're storing able to tobacco, offer, yeah. then, mm-hmm. yeah, they're able to offer it at that price. And, I mean, what are they going to – because, you know, if you're using the whole plant. You're using, like, the you know, the bottom third, the Seikos, the middle third, the Visos, and the top third, the Lajeros. I mean, it can't just be you're using just Viso and Lajero. you got to, like, the Seikos actually are delicious too, yeah. you know. So when you're offering a bigger ring gauge, then you can then you can include those in there, you know. Yeah, and I guess a lot of those successful extreme ring gauges, they're also like smokable, right? And that they're not too strong. Like, I think a, a new cigar client will look at that and automatically assume that, oh man, that's got to be really strong, or that's just so much tobacco, it's got to be strong. And I guess it could be if you blended it, you know, accordingly with like um, the same percentage of Lajeros as like, say, a 50 ring gauge. And it could maybe knock you out, but like I think a lot of those extreme ring gauges are blended very mild, or at least ah, interesting. Ceteris paribus, yeah, where that's just to just to tolerate, right? Because if I someone mean, had you, a, what's the largest ring gauge that you've smoked? Oh, you yourself? I mean, I, yeah, myself. I think I tried an eighty once, and I just just to try it. How did that? How did, in I mean, in terms it, of flavor, was profile? it uncomfortable from a mouth? Yeah, feel, from though. the physical standpoint, it's not. Yeah, I, I don't like it. Um, but from a flavor standpoint, it was actually really good. It wasn't mm. bad. I just, yeah, I just don't like the feel of it. And in fact, I don't like anything really above, this is me personally, like anything above 54. Mm. You know, but that's just me. I like a, a smaller ring gauge. Um, but yeah, it, the, the, the the extreme ring gauge format is just, it's really interesting. Uh, the other thing I find interesting is that like people still like, you know, and I noticed this during the CAO days. That's why we, because again, I like I like being out there and talking to people and finding out like what they're smoking, why they're smoking, that kind of thing. I just find it like really interesting. And um I noticed that some people that were like serious cigar smokers would on occasion want to smoke a uh, a flavored cigar, and I asked them why, and they said, "Well, it's kind of like coffee. Sometimes I, w- I don't want to drink just black coffee. Yeah. Sometimes I may want a coffee with like a flavored creamer, or mm-hmm. I may want, you know what I mean? Every now and pumpkin then. spice. Now that we're yeah, in the season, right. yeah, yeah, every yeah, now sure. and then. So I mean, I still yeah. think it's interesting. When you've had this um, FDA threat mm. of legislating flavored cigars, yeah. which was kind of like driven really by um, wanting to curb youth from smoking it or from buying like let's say grape flavored right. Swisher sweets right. for last lack of a better example, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but still people like to come in and buy cigars that have a little bit of sweetness on the tip. Yeah, but now they're not not wanting to market it as such because yeah. of fear of this legislation. So I I think that's an yeah. interesting. I can thing think of too. I can think of certain companies who have cigars that I swear when I smoke it, it it tastes it smokes like it's sweetened, but some of these manufacturers won't say it is for fear maybe that if FDA does have their way with banning flavored yeah or any altering I forget what the, the terminology is but like anything that they add to really alter the flavor, they just won't say because they they want that they know it's still popular enough and to warrant some some revenue. Um, they don't want to ruin that, but uh, yeah, the ring gauge phenomenon is interesting. I guess new since since the your days at CAO, yeah, yeah the, totally. the flavored thing. What other trends have you noticed are different now, or, well, or that are new for you since you since you? Well, certainly, I noticed that like the consumers are much more uh, interested and knowledgeable mm-hmm. about like what they're smoking, you know, where they're smoking it from. What regions, if they want to, they can find out about. So, I mean, like, for example, uh, you know, maybe 15 years ago, you wouldn't have a consumer come up and say, oh, uh, I know what Omotepe is, you know, which is a volcanic island that is growing tobacco in Nicaragua, and now they will. Mm -hmm. But I think that's like the advent of people, like, if they want to do research and find out about stuff, then it's it's more easily accessible for them, you know, through the Internet. Mm -hmm. And now certainly Mm -hmm. you have AI coming into the equation. Are you so, implementing AI or looking at it? In oh, your all business? the time. That's my wife says. You know, your new best friend, Chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, yeah, I ask it stuff all the time. I mean, I, yeah. I think it's like, I mean, for some stuff, it's not. 
I mean, I, I don't want to be a hundred percent reliant on it for, for things, but I think it's like, it's useful in certain instances, you know, I mean, uh, um, marketing perhaps, uh, like I always wonder, like, is AI going to be enough of a disruptor for the cigar industry? Maybe not from a manufacturing side, yeah, yeah. but perhaps from a sales and, and marketing side. Sure. Well, and, like for example, if, if I said to AI, um, you know, uh, write a descriptive uh, for X, Y, and Z if I want to do a description of like a blend, right? Mm. And I tried this once and they actually wrote a pretty good description as a base. And then I and then I edited it and I tweaked it and I made it, I, you know, I kind of I kind of changed a bunch of stuff. But there was some stuff on how they kind of... Uh, they had a bias to, or maybe... Didn't have accurate? No, I mean, just the way that they kind of put together certain elements of what I wanted to describe into, like, you know, sentencing format that I thought was actually pretty pretty well done. And others that I thought maybe didn't, you know, they didn't have that same kind of, um, uh, you know, emotion behind what you wanted to convey about it that, that I would kind of put in, you know. But And sometimes when you're stuck and you want to get going, particularly when you have like a writer's block or something like that, it can yeah. kind of help as a, um, almost like when you when you have a, a, a pile that is a pile of hay, you know, it helps kind of ignite the hay. You know, once you have that, once you have it going, then you can kind of tweak it from there, you know, so, mm. but really I haven't used it that much for that. Yeah. I mean, really it's more like if, if you want to, like for example, if you want to go on, um, I mean, if you want to go on fall break somewhere with your family and you're like, where can I go that is, you know, within driving distance of where I live, that would be a fun three day itinerary for my family. It's pretty good with that. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. I use it for more stuff like this, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Uh, I've used it for to, to generate like a, a trip itinerary as well. The last yeah, few years. Yeah. Because and it's come uh, up with some good, good output because I use chat GPT too. Right. From time to time. You know, because if you're busy running your business over here, you're like, oh, my God, the least thing I, to, I mean, really, I have to go on the Internet now and, like, do research on, like, where I'm going to go if I want to go to, like, you know, Gettysburg or whatever it is. And mm -hmm. then they can they can put together for you, like, this is a this is an idea, like, two, three days. If you want to yeah. go visit Gettysburg, do this, this and this, you know, then yeah. you have a good starting point. So I think mm -hmm. for that for that purposes, I mean, it's 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 good or it's handy. You know, on the way down here, if I said, what's a good sandwich shop that I could stop at in Baton Rouge, then it might give me – now, I won't do it because I'll ask you your opinion, and then right, I'll get right. what you tell me. So that. it's interesting you bring that up in that the output is only as good as the input, right, with chat GPT. And we're still, I guess, in the early days of this new phenomenon. And I remember reading a, or seeing a headline maybe at last year of the bias um, dynamics and maybe the racist huh. dynamics oh, with really? chat GPT or AI. And I, and I didn't really read enough of it, but what I maybe kind of intuitively was thinking why that would be is, you know, chat GPT right now is just like trying to scrounge up and absorb every piece of data they can get from the Internet or the input. So I started as an experiment last year, pose a question kind of similar, but with cigar shops. Hmm. Like, who are the best cigar shops in Louisiana, chat GPT? Oh, you, you did mm -hmm. that? Yeah, interesting. And so I wanted to see what it said. And I would actually respond like, well, that's not correct. It's, you know, we have a bias. It's Habana Port is the leader in Louisiana. And, mm -hmm. I, and I started giving reasons why and like trying to feed it in the hopes that, oh, maybe chat GPT will learn from this and then realize whether it's true or not. Right. But I'm, what I'm bringing up is that maybe the, mani the manipulative uh, effects or possibilities with, with this technology. Right, whether it's true or not, um, and I'm sure there are big entities in our industry, like retailers or catalog guys, who already kind of knew that. Maybe are, they're trying to feed Chat GPT, whether it's right or wrong, but it, it'll help benefit them, right? Uh, and I'm sure I'm not bring posing anything new that maybe some of these smarter people that uh, haven't thought of. But uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I think what, what's going to happen, but I mean, I don't know if it'll substantially change our industry uh, because it's still such an old world craft and that's kind of the appeal from, from my standpoint. Yeah, I think I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I think for our industry, there's such a sense of like, you know, it, there's such nuance to our industry, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of it is based on like, you know, almost like, you know, flavor, combination of elements, you know, again, like to go back to the, the type of promotions that we're going to be doing over here, it's sort of like mm -hmm. what you and I might taste might be different than somebody else may taste because of a variety of reasons. Like, you know, how many years have we been smoking cigars? Have we been to a factory? Have we, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. all those kind of things that 
will lead us to taste something different than what someone else may taste, you know, from a tobacco standpoint. And then combining them, aging them, how long are you aging it? What types yeah. of tobaccos are they? Do they do yeah, some so tobaccos? Many, so right? much, There's yeah. so much variable yeah, yeah. that I think that that's Im- uh, it's impossible for like a, a chat GBT to kind of, you know, really kind of have that much of an impact yeah. relative to that because it's such a it's such a, you know, we're we're relying on on mm. taste and we're relying on you know yeah. there's so much human element that goes into that that I think you're right. I mean, for our industry, it's like. Maybe not yet. Maybe 100, 200 years from now, maybe that can come about. Yeah. But for now, at least during our lifetimes, it, it might not have as much of a impact. Yeah. But who knows? But it's interesting to think about. Mm-hmm. No question. Mm-hmm. Uh, and talking about innovation, I want to bring this up. This disposable oh. ashtray. You got to tell yeah. me about this. Because I thought um, <laughs> when we got the event package and it, disposable ashtray, I was very, um, what's the word, uh, skeptical of it. But yeah. then I was like, when we when we started assembling them, I was just looking at it. I just thought, man, you know what? This is actually kind of brilliant. You know, you might get some laughs from people, but it's such a good marketing piece, right? It's probably cheap. I don't know the cost, but I was yeah. looking at the vendor that that you used. Um, the vendors out of the vendors out of Texas. Okay. And um, you know, the thing of it is, is that uh, you know we were talking about like uh, uh, other retailers that we're friends with. So you know, my retailer friend Craig Cass said, mm-hmm. "Oh, I saw this." product at the trade show and this might be a good product for you to utilize for these promotions and so then um i visited a store that was in um i think it was in dallas fort worth actually that had some for their store and so then i asked them about it they're like oh yeah it's a it's a gentleman who's like you know in the area who produced them and then i got his information from that retailer and i contacted him the only only thing i'll say about it is that you cannot have it on a, a fabric surface and it is actually in the small print at the bottom of it. So the very first event that I ever did of this, because, you know, the idea is people are smoking like a purito, like it's a 100% piece of tobacco as if I pulled it from a bale and rolled it right there in front of you and it said, here, smoke this. This is, you know, Mexican San Andreas wrapper. And so it's not a blend. It's not a cigar. Yeah, you're you're smoking, smoking the one individual component. That's right. Yeah. And then you, and the idea is you put it down here. And then you go to the next one, and you put it down here. Then you have the finished product, and you put it down here. And so, like, you you basically have six different lit, like, you know, pieces of tobacco that are in this thing. But if you have it over an armchair of an overstuffed sofa, which is what happened the first event I did it at Viso Cigar Lounge in, in Dallas, Texas, it actually burns through it, what? and then it burns through a hole in the fabric. Oh. So I didn't know this. Yeah. So now, so on this table, it's fine. Okay. Because it's a hard surface. Mm. But if you had a tablecloth on top of it, and you had the cherry here, well, then it'll burn through this and burn through the uh, burn through the fabric. Yeah. So, but but on the hard surface, it doesn't burn through. Hmm. So that's the only thing I'll say about them is that they're neat from like a branding standpoint, and they're neat because you can you know we also utilize it to put some t- in some instances we'll put all of the six cigars in them. And then people can take them out, and then like you know the other tobacco, the pure tobacco ones, just have codes on them. So you'll you'll see when we do it. Um, but yeah, so I mean, in the in the instance of you know we can get it quickly, to what we talked about earlier, um, we don't have to order like a huge quantity. A B, we can get them quickly. C, they serve their purpose. You know that part of it. That part of it's really good. The only Asterisk is you can't do not put uh, it on a don't put it on an overstuffed leather chair and okay. burn through it. But I mean, it is kind of innovative and in, sets you apart. I mean, I've, I've, this is the first time I've seen this product, yeah. so I didn't know if you're one of the first manufacturers to, to really utilize this. I think it's it's you know at least it's, it's going to get people thinking and, and maybe remembering. Yeah, yeah, your yeah. New brand. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, like you know, it's uh we've always been open minded to that and always been like wanting to. Uh, um, you know, almost like utilize any sort of innovation that's out there. And, and, uh, and we, and the reason it, that is, is that like, you know, we've, <laughs> we've worked under like a lot of circumstances, you know what I mean? Like I've, I've gone through like, you know, the very small teeny startup from the basement of our home as a family, you know, and my sister and I just working in the garage and you know what I mean? Like pricing pipes and then, you know, growing the business organically and then becoming a part of like, you know, 
a big kind of conglomerate and working under that environment too. I mean, but I'm a big fan of small business. I'm a big fan of like, you know, especially your family is so engaging and, you know, you can tell you guys care about the customers. And I think that I like businesses like that because I mean, I think, I, I don't know. I think that's, that's like a really kind of, um, that's really kind of inspiring to see. And so I like to kind of, you know, work with companies that are like that or, you know what I mean? Cause mm-hmm. I, I've been there. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so yeah. it's, it's, you know, so hopefully in this case, you know, the, the gentleman that created these, like, you know, would write us very nice. Thank you. Like, uh, emails for thanks for ordering them oh, and cool. stuff like that. So that's, that's neat too. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's cool. No, it's, uh, and, and, and you know, <sighs> seeing crown heads start, you know, when they announced that, you know, John and Mike were getting together it was cool to see, and we were we were right there like early on trying to, you know, establish ourselves as an account with them. And then to see here when you when you announced that you were joining them, it's cool to see like all these intersections in the past like coming back to join, and it's just it's it's really fascinating to see. So we wish you luck, and thank you. you. Know, I'm excited about tonight, um, seeing what 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 you'll inform our, our clients about your 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 blend. So, um, and part of it I feel like is that, um, you know. Uh, you want to work from your heart. You want to do what it is that you like to do. And hopefully that, that, you know, that have, has an interest for people. So mm-hmm. that's, that's kind of like the, why I wanted to do these style of events, you know, cause hopefully people enjoy them and they have an interest in them. And I, I think that what I've experienced is that, you know, the people that are really into cigars and want to learn more about cigars, um, that's kind of the target, mm-hmm. you know, is for people that really, you know, I like cigars. I have an interest in them. I want to, get more into them, more knowledge up about them. Um, you know, that's kind of, that's sort of like, you know, what we're kind of, we're trying to kind of gear it up for is, is those that want to like mm-hmm. deepen their knowledge about the nuances behind the cigar and the cigar business. Yeah. What I call, and you've probably heard the term the cigar nerd, but you know, not from a, a derogatory standpoint, like that real enthusiast to yeah. what your point you were alluding to earlier was that that customer now that once like actually cares about the components where it's from, what, why is it different than this other blend? Um, not just your typical guy, which there's nothing wrong with that. But you know, we have clients that they stick to that one cigar. They don't care to know who what family is involved or how it gets here. They just want that cigar and they're they're happy with it. Yeah. But this this new, I guess, newer type of mindset where, yeah, you have an interest like a real curious consumer and yeah and for me i like that that kind of mindset too yeah i heard a really um i have a friend that sends out these like quotes of the day every day and i mean part of it i want to say he's a friend of mine from nashville sometimes you get those emails you're like really you're still doing this (laughs) (laughs) so you know but he sent one today that actually might have been one of my favorite ones Mm. but and i forget what it was exactly to that but the 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 idea was that uh education never ends like Mm. you're always learning something and um, and I kind of view that as, uh, for me, like in the cigar business, you know, you're always learning something and you should be open to it, mm-hmm. you know, because, you know, if you're not open to it, then you then I think that you can kind of like it can be dangerous because, you know, one thing my dad said, um, one thing for sure about life is change. Right. I mean, there's always change happening. So it just it is what it is. Mm. And you just have to kind of like accept that that's how it is. And and sort of be open to it and to go with it. And, um, you know, I, I like to think that, um, due to the fact that I grew up in the industry and, um, and I've had a lot of experience for that, that that is a helpful historical point of reference. Hmm. But, you know, like we were talking about earlier, there's like, you know, tons of people that don't know anything about like, you know, the history that we've been through, you know? So at the end of the day, it really has to be about, you know, what I've learned aggregate from that and like hopefully not make the same mistakes twice, you know, I yeah, mean, yeah. and just like yeah. learn and always be open to learning. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, that's, that's part of what makes the business also like, uh, um, I think that's also what brings people like if they've been in the business before back to it is that, um, it's challenging. It can be complex and, and, you know, a lot of hurdles to go through, but at the end of the day, you're creating a product, like we said at the beginning, that brings joy to people's lives, that brings people together, that causes people to slow down and really kind of in an organic way without even them knowing to connect with one another. And, um, and you know, I, so I, th- I think that part of it is really like, that's, that's really the joy of being in the cigar business. 
yeah. is is that connectivity that you would have with people that you otherwise may never have you know met. Yeah. No, I think that's a good uh, ending for this yeah. uh, conversation because we got the event. Yeah. And I know people are, are probably waiting. Um, and I hope you can come. You're always welcome back yeah, to course, do more of these. Well, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be down in Louisiana, so yeah. you're going to be like, can I get this guy out of my store? <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Love it. You're always welcome. Your family, yeah. your family is so uh, warm and great, and it was really a, a great kind of um, – you know, I knew I wanted to come down here a day early for a reason. And I mean, you know, meeting your brother and your father and now you has been like, you know, really a great gift. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah. No, we'll, we'll be glad to do this. And uh, I don't know if my father told you at, at the, the next trade show, which will be in New Orleans. Yeah. We're going to have a booth, uh, an area to do podcasting. Oh, that's great. So we'd love to have you. And he told me Thanks. some of the, the conversation you guys had, or maybe ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Maybe certain tasting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. want to give away too much, but yeah, yeah, I think that'll be exciting. Well, um, he's a, he's a sharp man, and I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you and your brother are same. Yeah, <laughs> and look, there's a lot of core like parallels between like you and your father and yeah. the dynamics and us. Just hearing, you know, he's he's an immigrant, right? And he had the accent, yeah. and my friends would always bust my chops about his accent being so strong, and I just kind of let, you know play it off and just just be a com comedian about that. You know, and we had our uh, um, you know, we had a you know this very humble ranch style house that we started our business with, and then we had like just you know the upstairs and we would live there and have like you know a small kitchen and living and then downstairs is where we'd have the cigars and my dad would have a display of pipes and then when i had friends over he'd be like your dad's a drug dealer and i'm like yeah, no he's not yeah, a drug dealer yeah. these are these are tobacco Dude, that's pipes funny say that. <laughs> yeah when i make when i deliver cigars you know from our, our corporate store to here and putting these boxes, I always feel like, man, what I think people think I'm a drug dealer. Like moving <laughs> these weird boxes. I'm a big guy with a cigar looking like Tony Soprano. It's like, oh, geez. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. That's funny. That's awesome. Well, look, before we sign off, would you do me the favor of doing our lightning round? It's five questions. Sure. Real simple. All right. Number one, crystal, Tabasco, or other? Oh, for hot sauce, Yeah, you hot mean? sauce, yeah. Um, I'm, again, I love hot sauce. I'm open to trying any other hot sauce. Um, I would probably say uh other just because i like i like the sauces that are not as vinegary okay you know so okay i mean yeah, if you have a particular brand that you like hot sauce no i mean you know i like uh, um what's i mean i think cholula is good i okay. like that okay i also like um what's the one that that is with the uh with the rooster and the i'm, I'm forgetting it the uh hmm. with the green cap sriracha oh yeah 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 yeah. That's yeah right. i like that yeah. too but mm -hmm. now i find also i like the just the dry spices oh because the dry spices then there's no um sugar added to that and i like that too i'm finding like a lot of dry mixture of of like you know whether it's cayenne and you know creole spice i mean i like i like those combinations too oh okay um number two it's probably getting the order wrong if you could smoke a cigar with anyone Historical, like dead or alive, right? Who would you want to smoke a cigar with? The Dalai Lama. Oh, wow. I don't know if he smokes cigars or not. That's good. He answer. probably doesn't, but I mean, I just think he's interesting. I yeah. just think, from a spiritual standpoint, I think that that would be an interesting. He probably doesn't smoke cigars, but I mean, he he lights incense. Yeah, <laughs> he can light he's, incense he's probably, while I smoke look, a cigar. <laughs> Tobacco is divine, so I'm sure he's of that mindset. Maybe he would enjoy a cigar. Uh, number three, uh, favorite vacation destination. Um, I like going to the um, uh, uh, I like going to the south of Turkey on the Med anything on the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean um, is uh, uh, doesn't have as many waves, doesn't have any sharks or fish. You oh. tend to float in it well. The water temperature is warm, so you know now the summers are getting hotter and hotter. So I think that anything on on the Mediterranean, uh, I like. Okay, uh, number four for industry people, I ask this a little different. What is your desert island cigar from your own? Company okay. and what's your desert island cigar from a, a, a someone outside your company? Uh, I mean, you know, for us since we've been through so many different like you know blends and stuff like that, for me it's a five and a half by fifty five box press is my shape is what oh, okay. I like, and I like it in our Bosphorus blend over here for our Oz family cigar. So I would say probably that from from us. Okay. Uh, as far as from another uh, company, I'm always like smoking so many different cigars from different companies that I honestly don't have one that I could tell you that I would I would say that's my go-to from a different company. I, I just don't – I can't think of one that yeah. I land on. You know, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I just like so many different blends, and mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends in the industry that yeah. make great cigars. So yeah. I can't – I don't have an answer for that one. 
Number five, last one. Who would you want to hear on a future podcast episode here? Oh, it could be anyone. Oh, anyone. Yeah. Who would you want me to interview for a future? Oh, God, I don't know. I mean, um, so it doesn't have to be somebody no, from the cigar that, no. industry or anything like that. Yep. Could be a celebrity. It could be a sports figure. Someone you know. Gosh, I don't know. I mean, you know, another really another really tough question. I'm trying to think of someone that I think is an interesting person that likes cigars to hear from. You yeah. know, um, I mean, they don't even have to smoke cigars. We've had, I think, only one guest that didn't want to smoke a cigar, and we're just fine. That didn't want to smoke a cigar. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know. That's that's quite interesting. I mean, you know, I would, at the risk of being controversial, <laughs> I mean. I, I th- yeah, and, th- and this is no like vote of like whether you approve of this guest. It could be someone maybe controversial, maybe someone you hate. Who would you want to hear? I might be interested in hearing a little bit more about um, behind to be more spe- cigar specific. Okay, someone involved in Habanos uh, in Cuba that you had on here because I would okay. I would like to hear about their context of uh, of Habanos and of. Cuban cigars, and you know what I mean? Fidel Castro obviously has passed away, so he would be an interesting person to hear about. But Especially, that has especially a- near the end of his life when he went anti-cigar. I have so many questions about that. Yeah, so I think someone that maybe like has, has been in Cuba mm-hmm. from the, like, that is a, that is a historic figure. Yeah. I mean, you know, maybe, I mean, I would say like it would be interesting f- to hear from like a Rabina, you know, or someone like that, mm-hmm. you know, about about their kind of journey in Cuba, uh, you know, in tobacco making cigars. So I'd probably I'd probably say like my mind is floating towards there today. I like you know? that. Yeah. That's so I don't know. Doing. I mean, you know, because they've gone through some interesting kind of arcs and changes. And now with, you know, the Chinese being involved in that, mm-hmm. you know, like. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think that that would be an interesting listen. So I'll probably go there. Yeah, I uh, just to give you insight, I actually interviewed someone a few weeks ago from from like the Cuban sector. I just I don't know if I'm going to reveal it just because mm-hmm. the audio was really poor, and it was before I got the the, you know, the road wireless. I was doing it right, from like the camera. Right. I just didn't pick up the audio. I was really bummed out because uh, I was asking him like, especially like since we're in the industry, we're going to ask like different questions like. You know, give us like real answers, not just like the the magazine article, like you know, good portrait. Like I want to know like what's really going on. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. But we'll see. I, my producer's been trying to figure out if he can alter and improve that audio. Yeah, so. yeah. Now what's going to happen is I'm going to get off here and I'm going to come up with five people. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Throw that at you. But. That, that means you just got to come back and we'll we'll, we'll do more of these. So awesome. Well, if, Tim, I appreciate you coming down no, and thank helping you us very out. Much. I'm thank excited you. for the event. So. Yeah, me too. Good luck to you. Thank you. I right. appreciate yep. you. You're thank great. You. Very appreciate comfortable. You. All right, everyone. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.